You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 30, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, environmental health assessments. Our presenter is Kevin Kennedy. He's the director for the Center of Environmental Health at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. So just a little bit of uh, background. So uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, principles of at-home environmental assessments. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the research evidence to support environmental assessments, but there's a little bit heavier emphasis on um, uh, our approach here at Children's Mercy, uh, just to serve as kind of a guideline. I don't know who all of you are, but uh, welcome and glad to have you all here. I have some handouts for those that are, are listening in. I do have some handouts that we will make available um, somehow, probably on a OneDrive or on Teams or something where they can get access to it. But I want to hand these out uh, to each of you. So I've got to barely made enough copies, so you'll know what these are here in a little bit as I talk about them. I don't have enough of them for... Go ahead. I can give uh, Felicia and uh, Jessica, maybe I can... You may want to hand them off. <laughs> I'm going to make sure the people that who, who I haven't met before are getting copies of these things. Uh, and I, we have plenty back at the office. I just didn't realize how many people it's easy. So I apologize for that. Thank you. So I, uh, I am a part of our environmental health program. That we've actually had an official program here since about 2001. We've actually been going into homes since about 1995. Uh, Jay Portnoy was our section chief and division director over those years, in the early years, and uh, it was because of Dr. Portnoy's recognition of the role environment plays in allergic disease that he advocated to uh, administration here to allow him to actually hire a uh, independent consultant to go to some homes to investigate concerns in homes uh, back in the 90s. And uh, the result of that was uh, advocating to uh, get community organizations to invest in home improvements to the homes of some patients that he was struggling to manage their asthma. And uh, the result was improvement of the environment and a reduction in the need for medications. And some of those kids didn't return back in urgent care or uh, hospitalization. So this was uh, 20, almost 25 years ago. Uh, so that, that informed him of the value of an environmental assessment, of focusing on reducing exposure, all the things that are now a part of the guidelines, and we'll talk about that. This is our staff, just to let you know, so the environmental health program doesn't just cover asthma. Um, uh, we started out in asthma allergy way back, and we're part of the asthma allergy division, but in about 2010, we became a separate entity, and the hospital structure changed to where any provider in the hospital system could make a referral for an environmental consult. That got built into our electronic health system, so through Cerner, you can make a referral for any of your patients, and I encourage you to make a referral. That does not mean that they'll get a home assessment. It means we will talk to them about what their concerns about their environment is. And we have a couple of forms that you're going to see about what might happen in a home or what their concerns are, and based on how they what information they provide to us, we make the determination both of whether a assessment is is necessary, but also what level of risk they are probably uh, dealing with. And we, you'll see the stratification here as I go through this. So we've been in uh, really about 2,000 homes over the years. Uh, 1,600 or so have had more of a formal assessment, and you'll see what that means. We've also been in uh, probably two or 3,000 classrooms in um, I don't know how many buildings, a couple hundred buildings. We have long-term contracts with some of the local school districts to, to both do uh, environmental audits of their buildings, so we do a detailed walkthrough of every building in that district. So, for example, two of the districts we work with right now, we have five-year contracts 
that we visit a group of their buildings every year because it's such a detailed audit. It takes us an average of a week to, uh, for elementary schools and two to three weeks to go through every part of a high school. And we do a systematic physical condition assessment and then an environmental exposure assessment. The research is pretty clear that academic performance is associated with a good environmental quality. Um, the effectiveness of a teacher in, in teaching uh, is higher when you're in a healthy environment to teach a class, right? So um, uh, that's why these districts uh, pay us to, to do the work. And uh, in Missouri, they're paid for uh, the number of days a child is literally sitting in the classroom. So the more they can reduce absenteeism, the more money they make. And we had a district tell us if we could help them reduce absenteeism by a half a percent, it equaled $1 million in revenue, just simply having the kids uh, in the seats. So it was a no-brainer for them. So um, that's been pretty cool. So. Uh, you're all, I think, aware. I'm not going to dig too deep into uh, asthma guidelines, but there are some key components there that I, I will touch on. Uh, one being in 2007 when the guidelines were updated, there was a focus th at that time and an addition on environmental factors and um, comorbid conditions, but a real uh, intent to um, advocate for reducing exposure in the indoor environment. So, uh, of course, you all are are well aware of the Asthma Action Plan, but a key part of that is the discussion about environment, discussion about triggers, what do they know about their, uh, their environmental triggers or non-environmental triggers, whether it's weather or emotions or whatever it is, uh, but, but consciously being aware of what role the environment plays in their Asthma Action Plan. And then the whole process of stepping up, stepping down um, in the context of what role environment plays in that as well. Are they getting into an environment that's causing a flare-up of some kind? Do they need to leave that environment? They, they, they're becoming more self-aware of what environments, what, what their sensitivities are, and where they might find those environments, and what are the clues in their own symptoms that they're starting to feel, hey, there's something going on here. I need to get out of this space. And even our own staff going into homes that have been really in pretty bad shape have had to, oh my gosh, I'm having symptoms. I need to get out of here. Um, they could tell that they were about to have a, an asthma flare. So the guidelines uh, specifically say that exposure to uh, inhalant allergens and, and irritants and contaminants um, clearly increase uh, symptoms, uh, uh, exacerbate their condition, can lead to significant flare-ups and attacks, uh, elevate them in their action plan, and that uh, successful management of asthma involves managing the environment and, and managing any potential exposure and reducing the potential for exposure to triggers and, and eliminating those allergens that, um, that they are allergic to. The other key thing is the, uh, the emphasis, and, and this is even more uh, well understood and established today, on a multifaceted, multi-component, comprehensive approach to uh, environmental management for asthma, whether it's at home, whether it's in a school, wherever it is. So that comes from the idea that uh, you were just talking about dust mites. Uh, that uh, it was thought before that oh, we just give people mattress encasements and we've taken care of the dust mite problem. You know, you're all done. Uh, but the reality is dust mites being highly adaptable will live anywhere in the environment, wherever there are skin cells, right, or other uh, microbial detritus that they can uh, consume. So you'll find them in, in living rooms, family rooms. You'll find them around uh, aquariums because the fish food is a form of, of skin flake like material so they thrive on that. Um, they're, so they're found throughout the house. So the reality was, as it says in the lower right, single steps, the research just showed weren't effective. You really had to have a multifaceted approach. So for dust mites, it's not just a uh, mattress cover. It is the mattress cover along with uh, teaching about regular routine vacuuming, maybe removing allergen reservoirs. Let's take the carpeting out of a bedroom. Let's uh, take out the layers of bedding. Let's take out the two or 300 stuffed animals. That's how many my kids had anyway. Take out the, the number of stuffed animals, the allergen reservoirs, whereas dust can settle that isn't routinely cleaned, and then over time you get a proliferation of microorganisms like dust mites who are free to 
to reproduce. So it's managing that whole space, and a key component of that is also managing moisture in the same space. So keeping the relative humidity in the room, the general relative humidity in the room, somewhere below 50% is considered ideal. Dust might thrive above 60% and will reproduce rapidly, and they adapt. They're very highly adaptable. If you can lower the humidity below 50%, they uh, go into a dormancy, they, they desiccate, and uh, then they, they, on very little moisture they can survive for months, and then one episode above 50% relative humidity, they rehydrate, and then they are able to readapt and, and try to live uh, longer. So they're very highly adaptable, and that's why they're found now worldwide. They, they were not around worldwide before World War II. So it's this focus on the uh, multifaceted approach. It's, it's Focus on education, certainly self-management, not just self-management of the disease and following their action plan and, and your recommendation of whatever uh, medical therapy, but also uh, understanding their own personal exposure triggers and how to manage those. That's part of self-management education. And then teaching them and providing tools ultimately to reduce exposure. So the goal or our goal in working with you and with your patients is to reduce exposure for of course, teach them what they need to do to reduce exposure by better management of those environments, but also to evaluate those environments and assess and characterize any kind of health risks while while we're there and educate them about that and give them lots of information. So I want to point you towards uh, what the evidence says. That, okay, that's the guidelines. Well, this is the last review in 2015 of uh, looking at the Institute of Medicine uh, in 2000 with uh, Clearing the Air, which was a, um, a report on asthma and the environment, what the evidence said in, in the year 2000 and in 2015, um, this update article looked specifically at what does the research say now as far as looking at systematic reviews and what all the literature says. So these are key things that the literature says now. So and you were just talking about, one again, sufficient evidence of a causal relationship for these three factors, exposure to dust mite allergen, exacerbation of asthma, children sensitized to dust mites, cat allergen exposure uh, associated at a causal level with exacerbation of asthma, and cockroach allergen exacerbation uh, uh, for as an individual specifically sensitized to cockroach. And then sufficient evidence of a causal association, not quite the same level of evidence, but high enough to be of concern, would be related, and this is an important, to dampness and dampness-related agents in the exacerbation of asthma. So it's, it's, it's living in chronic dampness or living in chronically damp conditions, and then the uh, we now understand more and more, not, not just the molds, but the microecology of the house is altered by, or, or the indoor environment is altered by the excess moisture. Excess moisture provides a selective advantage to certain uh, microbial species who can outcompete other microbial species. So an example of one that we actually have a published uh, article out on uh, is uh, we looked at the DNA of microbes in homes and found in homes of kids with asthma an excess amount of cyanobacteria. Well, that's blue-green algae, which is uh, causing toxic plumes now in a lot of lakes. But So you, you, you provide a selective advantage to certain microbes that people are exposed to or they're exposed to the byproducts of. You, you've heard of mycotoxins, well, endotoxins coming from bacteria. There's a lot of, of uh, endotoxin in, in these chronically damp homes. And uh, that actually shows up under sufficient evidence of association is this uh, indoor endotoxin exposure and exacerbation of asthma. So there's some kind of connection that's not understood, and there's certainly lots more research that might need to be done. But the, the key is that chronically damp homes have a different microecology than a typical home that might have a, a normal uh, ecology. So then, uh, again, for this literature, sufficient evidence of an association between chronic environmental tobacco smoke, exacerbation of asthma, preschool age children, is, the evidence is pretty clear that, that there's a lot of risk associated with kids under five being exposed to tobacco smoke, and not just exacerbation of asthma, but there's a hint of a possible relationship to the development of asthma. So they just shouldn't be exposed. That's just something. Uh, any kind of smoke, in particular tobacco smoke, uh, exposure should be avoided. And then dog allergen is implicated here, and uh, so is brief high-level exposures to nitrogen dioxide. So nitrogen dioxide is a, a combustion byproduct from gas appliances, 
people are specifically concerned, and rightfully so, with carbon monoxide exposure, poisonous gas, uh, low-level exposure over time leads to cardiovascular effects. But, but nitrogen dioxide is a, an, another byproduct of combustion byproducts. It is not regulated in any way. And as they have improved uh, combustion appliances for energy efficiency reasons to make them more energy efficient and also to reduce the potential for carbon monoxide production. Uh, you still have to balance the equation, so there ends up being more nitrogen dioxide production from these high efficiency combustion appliances, so a high efficiency stove or whatever it is. So uh, people tend to uh, you know, keep the stove on, not use their exhaust fan, uh, maybe they're cooking a turkey or baking pies or whatever. This is where we see um, buildup of nitrogen dioxide in an indoor environment where they, where they haven't uh, done anything to exhaust that uh, uh, byproduct out. 99.9% uh, .9 of homes uh, ha are closed systems. The only way fresh air gets in is when people open windows or doors. Uh, they do not have a designed source of mechanical ventilation or fresh air ventilation. 99.9% .9 of commercial buildings like this one have to have a designed source of mechanical ventilation. So there's a air vents from the outside connected to the air handlers for this building to provide a portion of fresh air constantly. That's not true in homes. Uh, it's in incidental through doors and windows as they are open. Now, it, with new modern energy efficiency of homes, uh, it's built into the standard if, if it's applied to a new or existing home where they actually measure and monitor to see what level of air leakage there is, and they may include mechanical ventilation as part of that. That's just important for you to know that homes are closed systems. So the pollutants that get inside concentrate uh, by generally a factor of two to five, meaning those nitrogen dioxide compounds, if you're cooking for a long period of time, the particles, the chemicals, uh, the nitrogen dioxide builds up in an indoor home, and it can become, over time, uh, a significant uh, exposure. So I want to point to this. If you haven't seen it, this is a really nice uh, review from Joy Sue and her colleagues on uh, the economic evidence for asthma self-management and home-based intervention programs. Uh, in that review, uh, they found some, uh, they looked at some 42 programs that met the criteria, and of those, about 18 or 20 of them were uh, at home visiting programs. And the economic evaluation showed that there was a positive return on investment. So that means for um, the dollars spent on the assessment program and the home environmental interventions and all of that, the savings from the reduced utilization were significantly higher than the investment of that additional case management, that environmental assessment and intervention. So ROI is a hot topic in the world of asthma, especially for home visits. So she did this review of all of these different programs across the country. And this is just to point out that uh, uh, they reviewed our program as well from uh, 2000 to 2010, and at that time, in that analysis, we showed, uh, and there's a long history to how that program was set up back then, but the, there was a net savings of $1.57 for every $0.43 uh, dollars spent per man. That's per member per month. That's the economics that's used for, by a managed care system. They look at uh, the, the total care for asthma patients on a per member per month basis. So if I know that my cost of care per member per month is you know, so many hundred thousand, but I am able to implement this program at such and such a cost and I can reduce that utilization, that per member per mem uh, month cost, then I'm saving the managed care system, I'm saving the health care system, I'm reducing the utilization for those kids, and I'm keeping them out of the clinic, out of the hospital, well, not out of the clinic, actually more in the clinic, out of the hospital, out of the ED, out of urgent care. Ideally, if, you're, if they're following the right model, they're seeing you, the, the, the specialist or their pedi pediatrician, on a regular basis. They're upping their visits but reducing their emergency visits. That, that's the goal. And this, this was just to show you that our program was evaluated back then. And then we put out a couple of publications showing the impact of the program, just reduced utilization for ED hospitalization clinic visits. And then here we did a, just a quick analysis of um, our utilization of patients that participated in the program. And we're in the middle of doing another one, a QI project on them right now. We'll look back at a few of them. But uh, in, we uh, 
had a program going, but then uh, we did some interesting uh, analysis, partly working with an allergy fellow, uh, Jill Hansen, in 2016. And we did this analysis of Children's Mercy data and looked at data from 2009 to 2013 for 28,000 outpatient visits representing 10,000 patients. And this is the rough breakdown into ED visits, urgent care, or inpatient. And for each patient, uh, we took an outpatient visit and we looked back 12 months and ahead 12 months to see how much prior acute care visits were predictive of a future acute care visit. And in doing that, there was this significant uh, relationship between uh, past historic acute care visits and the likelihood of a future visit. And it turns out, uh, surprisingly linear, for every his, uh, one historical acute care visit a patient had in the past, the likelihood of a future acute care visit went up by a significant percent. So you got a big jump from zero to one historic visit in the predictive nature of a future visit. And then when they had two acute care visits, you get up to 40 to 50 percent likelihood of a future visit, and then it just went up higher from there. So what that told us was if we could just look at the data for a given patient and see how many acute care visits they've had in the past, they got a lot of them, they're likely to be coming back to visit us. So we need to cut off that cycle. We need to break this cycle of coming back to urgent care, uh, we need to intervene with self-management education, intervene with maybe a home visit, uh, and the, the uh, guidelines show, the research shows, if you do in-home education to reinforce what you all talk to them in the clinic, if we can go out into their home, into that environment, let's point to the exposures, point to the triggers, show us your medication, show us how you use the medication, reinforce the learning they learned in the clinic, uh, no question that impacts uh, they're, just how much they pay attention to uh, what that environment might play in the management of the disease. And then this shows that um, a large number of those acute care visits were really for a small number of patients. So it was the 80-20 rule applied. So 80% of this is the future acute care visits. So 80% of the acute care visits in the future were coming from those with uh, uh, past historic acute care visits. So you could focus your effort on those with, uh, that were high utilizers. You could identify them, those that are likely to be the future uh, uh, utilizers, and, and try to break the cycle. So that's when Children's Mercy established this high-risk asthma protocol that I'm assuming you're all aware of that we have this high-risk asthma protocol started in 2016. And a key part of that is, uh, and I have yet to meet an institution that has something similar, um, and I, I've talked to a variety of them, um, but we have this environmental health referral that's automatic. So if you look at the analysis, if they, if they have more than two acute care visits, they're automatically referred to social work and automatically referred to environmental health for a, a consult. Of course, you can refer any patient any time, uh, and we try to tell um, providers that the, what the research says is uh, if uh, a child is exposed to these certain environmental factors over time, they can develop disease. So you don't want to wait necessarily until they're having a bunch of acute care visits and make an environmental health referral. If they're reporting to you environmental concerns, and that if a child's being exposed to that over time, then over time that exposure potentially leads to the development or, or exacerbation of uh, allergic disease or asthma or something. So if we can get in, educate, and and maybe mitigate that environmental exposure. That, that's just a preventive approach as opposed to being reactive. So all high-risk patients have to go through asthma class. I think you're probably all aware of that. Um, uh, you already know about the action plan. Uh, we do use, and you're probably already well aware that we use the asthma control test. That's a, a valuable tool for us, a validated tool. The hospitals use it because it's uh, one of the things the U.S. News and World Report looks at to see how many patients have been had the ACT score administered to them, and they look for a high percentage rate. We're trying to get around 90% uh, administration rate for ACT. And so we uh, actually have a lot of data uh, for the ACT over time, we in environmental health. So once you've referred this, we uh, administer the ACT to get an ACT score, see what their control is. So we're looking at two things right there. We're looking at their historic utilization, past utilization, and then we're looking at their current control. What does the ACT score say? Are they are currently uh, well controlled or are they un uh, uncontrolled? Or if their ACT score is below 14, it's considered poorly controlled. So it's a, a way to look at how bad things are as far as how well they manage their asthma. Um, 
Then, of course, I've mentioned a couple of times now, you can make that referral that, uh, through the system, and actually any doc in the clinic or in the community can also make that referral through the patient portal, um, and our staff can t uh, steer you towards that if you need help with that. Um, and then once the referral is made, these are the general options, so we give them a lot of education. Uh, we may offer a, a general uh, assessment, sort of a general uh, uh, evaluation of the environmental risk that they're dealing with. We can refer them to a host of different organizations. We have partnerships with a host of organizations like us, uh, like uh, social work might have uh, community resources. Uh, but ours are targeted specifically towards uh, housing-related or environmental-related resources. So yes, we work with the medical legal partnership here at Broadway, for example, because some of the homes, the people we work with, they're renting a house or they're in some weird agreement with the landlord and they're, they're stuck in a very poor environment, deplorable conditions that we have seen families living in, and we want to get them out of those bad, bad situations if we can. So we try to work with whatever resources we can. We've had the good fortune over the last uh, almost 20 years now of having a wide array of grants. We've had three HUD grants. We've had several EPA grants, several foundation grants, uh, both supporting research and programmatic services and education. Currently, we have two grants. Uh, one is a uh, it's called Casey Health Corps, and I won't get into that today, but it's, it's very much about big data and geospatial analysis of population data. So we have about 500,000 asthma records from Children's Mercy that we're looking at the other social determinants and mapping that to create uh, predictive analytics for the Kansas City metro community based on all the data we have for that. The other one is called Asthma Friendly Home Partnership uh, Phase 2. Phase one was a, a, a home program that we established relationship with housing partners. In this phase two, we have the housing partners, but we also have developed a protocol to use community health workers. So we've trained about 30 community health workers, uh, lots of programs around the country, and most states are working towards having and reimbursing for the use of community health workers, the people to do the home visit. We are unique in the country in that we started out using environmental scientists to do the home assessments, and we're adding community health workers. Most places are using community health workers and realizing, oh, they don't know anything about buildings and environmental science. Uh, maybe we need to connect with someone who knows that. So, so we're going at it from one direction. They're coming at it from another direction. We realize the essential value of having that community health worker, uh, someone who's kind of a care coordinator, because uh, we, uh, part of our team is to send one of our health coordinators. We have a nurse coordinator and a community health specialist of our own. But, um, uh, there's a real value in using community workers. So we have trained a whole bunch. And this is, I'll pass this around, this is our protocol we developed for them. It's a four-touch, two-home visit model. So four-touch meaning two phone calls, one to talk and educate over the phone, arrange the home visit, do the first home visit, then do a second follow-up home visit. We give all families uh, healthy home supplies, cleaning supplies I'll talk about in a second, and then there's a follow-up phone call to check in with them. This is for the generally the lower risk ones. The higher risk ones we always try to send to our team uh, because they're usually either sicker or the environment is much, much worse. And We've got all the Ghostbusters stuff to you know, analyze what kind of environmental problems are going on. So uh, just to put some emphasis, the environmental history you collect is really important and is valuable in uh, understanding what kind of exposures are going on. It's valuable to us in understanding what those risks are. It tells us a little bit if we know uh, from you what, what their allergies are, and then we know from them, from some of our surveys, what kind of uh, reported environmental concerns exist that helps us understand what kind of things we might want to measure when we go to the home. So uh, we are also unique in the country and then we may do, we have our own lab, so we may do um, air samples, as you know. Uh, you probably all met Manati, those of you that are uh, doing any kind of, I don't know who's in a fellow training or not, because all of you? Oh, cool. All of you? Wow. We got a lot of fat, a lot of students here. How, how cool. Welcome. Anyway, <laughs> that, that's great. Um, so you'll, you'll work with Manati. So we have uh, our own ability to do air samples and also to do the environmental allergens. We've got lots of that. So um, we try to tailor our assessment to try to identify if those exposures exist. And then that allows us to tailor our interventions based on what we find to be the environmental exposures. So this is our uh, form we use as a survey. It's called uh, uh, tell us about your home, and it's just a 10-question quick survey 
ideally they're using it in the clinic over here they were supposed to. I don't know if they still are. I hope they are. Um, but uh, there are, it's real quick, real simple, uh, and there are questions like this, number five. When was the last time anyone observed any water leak, stains, or mold anywhere in the house? And then the options for response are in the last week, in the last month, in the last three months, in the last six months, not sure, and never. That's relevant because if they answer a lot of them as in the last week, then we know they're currently dealing with a host of different environmental risks that all play on each other. If there's a lot of dampness and you have a roach infestation, the two compound each other. Um, you get a whole lot more microbial exposure if you've got roaches in the house versus not having the roaches. Uh, and then do they smoke? And then uh, have they observed rodents or roaches? Have they, do they clean? So it's a quick survey to understand what they're dealing with now. So we take past utilization, asthma control test, tell us about your home. We call it our environmental risk test. And the combination of those we use to stratify patients into different exposure or risk levels. So um, the three give us our total exposure risk. And then we divide them basically into two groups, a lower risk group that gets this basic assessment service, which is a visual assessment and in-home education. Uh, we come back and, and provide a detailed report, detailed guidance. We give them lots of information, similar to what I provided you, that book that says everyone deserves a health, safe and healthy home. So that's a really nice uh, appropriate language level educational book that I highly recommend uh, looking through. There are two versions of that book. There, this is the one for an educator, and then there's one for the client, or in this case, let's say a caregiver, that's, that's a much thinner, that's just the key things they should know and, and we want them to focus on. And so we follow what are called the Keep It Principles. I'll touch on that in a second. There's a Healthy Home Keep It Principles. There's uh, eight uh, Healthy Home Keep It Principles, and they're very simple. Uh, keep it dry, safe, clean, pest-free, contaminant-free, um, uh, clean, um, maintain. So very simple concepts, uh, lots of advanced thinking behind them, but we want parents and caregivers to just do some simple things. Keep it dry. Just keep the house dry. Keep it clean. Keep the house clean. I mean, it's, it's, and we give them all the strategies to do that, but we want to make it as simple as possible. So uh, roughly 70% of uh, patients fall into the lower risk uh, group, and we can use community health workers and others to do that home visit. Roughly 30% fall into the higher risk, need a deeper environmental, we think, need a deeper environmental investigation. And typically it involves some kind of measurement or sampling on our part to collect information and, and help us understand specifically uh, what actions we're going to recommend to them. Um, all of that gets, is managed in a, in a red cap case management system, which if you wanted to, you could certainly see or have access to for your patients. We try to summarize the home assessment and put five key issues we found in a home into the EHR, so you should be able to find uh, that uh, summary. We don't generally put our full home assessment report up there. Uh, you'll see some examples of what it looks like, but they can typically have a lot of pages to them. And, rather than put all that up. It usually has a lot of photos of their home. We try not to be publishing that. So then we, uh, based on the case review, based on the interview, we will we meet regularly to do case, case reviews of all of our, uh, or of current cases, uh, whatever the status is. So we'll go, we meet as a group and talk about cases and what the concerns are, what the challenges are, what a family's reported. And in some cases, excuse me, a, a one of our case managers will bring a case to the group because they're trying to decide whether home assessment is appropriate and necessary. Sometimes that, that's hard to tell. Some, some, some families demand a, a home assessment, even though from talking to them, they really don't need one. It sounds like they're really on top of things. And then we go, we have found over the years, some of those homes we go to, and it's hard to find what their real concerns are. There are other things that they could be focusing on because their house is really well maintained and very clean, and they're really on top of managing the child's asthma. They're just really worried about the kid, and we, we totally get it. So uh, the other key thing is most programs like ours are a multi-visit model. The, your, uh, the behavior science and the, the asthma education programs show you can't just touch people once or touch them at their home once and you're done. You really have to interact with them over time because you're trying to change behaviors, change practices, give them tools and resources, see if they're using them, do they work. There's lots of interaction that's valuable to uh, really changing their whole 
approach uh, in order to reduce exposure and improve the management of the kid. And that often takes multiple visits. So for the lower risk one where we're using the community health workers, the four touch two visit model, that's this early phase here. So those patients generally are in, in this area here. It takes about a month, a month and a half, two months to work with those patients. For the really sick or um, high risk patients, uh, we interact with them for a longer period of time. And what you see is uh, the, this key interventions are put in place. So that is often repairs to the home. We have, like I mentioned, our grant. We have dollars to actually repair the home, to fix plumbing leaks, to replace bathroom uh, issues, to take out carpets, to replace floors, to, to make significant interventions to reduce exposure. And over the years, we've developed good relationships with some of our housing partners, and they have additional grant dollars. So we've had homes that have had as much as $40,000 spent on the home to try to fix the problems in that house, significant problems that some of these, you would not believe the conditions that some of these families uh, find themselves living in or coping with. It's just breathtaking what some people are forced to live with. Um, um, so we, we may end up working with them over a six month or in some rare cases as much as a year, just trying to get things in place and following along with them. But it's, it's, it's not easy. It's very difficult to stay. Uh, in place with them. So this is the grant I was talking about. So it provides dollars to support home assessments for 132 families. 32 of those are high risk. So that's that 70-30 rule I said. So about 70% are lower risk. We're trying to have community health workers do that. We're trying to create the workforce in Kansas City to do this uh, community-based work. And uh, moving forward. So this is that protocol that you're passing around with the four touches, two steps. And then as we go through homes, just to give you a sense, we, we aren't uh, just like going in and sitting in their living room and then going into the child's bedroom and looking for triggers. We really do a comprehensive evaluation of the whole building. So for example, um, we have had parents who've got a severe asthma kid and, and we're outside looking at the guttering. Well, why are you looking at the guttering of my house? My, my kid's got asthma, and I'm worried about the indoor environment. But then we can show them, well, well your house uh, shows evidence of some kind of water damage, and the guttering seems to be in really poor shape, and all the water appears to be pouring right down next to the foundation where it's seeping into the basement. The basement is chronically damp. We can see the microbial growth around the basement, and there are these connections within your house where actually your kid with the mold allergy is being exposed to all this mold coming from the basement because of this and this and this, but the moisture is coming from the bad guttering. Oh. Well, it's very much a, we call it a healthy home approach. It's a holistic, comprehensive look at the house as a system and how that system works or doesn't work that results in exposure to uh, not just one environmental factor, but it can be a whole array that they're being exposed to. And you might be trying to help them manage, say, the dust mites or manage uh, pollen or something that they have an allergy to. But it's these other poor, poor conditions, poor ventilation, poor air circulation that are contributing to and magnifying uh, what they're ex uh, exposures are and makes it difficult for them to even manage that one thing that you're concerned about. So that's why we look at the whole system. So here's those keep it principles. So dry, clean, safe, well-ventilated, pest-free, contaminant-free, well-maintained, thermally controlled. So that's an important concept. The healthy home concept is that we may be there about their asthma, but if we notice an unsafe condition, it's an opportunity. We're at the house. It's an opportunity to educate. So we not only give them cleaning supplies, but every family gets safety supplies for us because we're the people representing Children's Mercy. We're at a house of a young child, and they don't have any receptacle covers to keep their kid from electrical shock. We're going to give them electrical covers. If they don't have a carbon monoxide alarm, we're going to give them carbon monoxide alarm. If they don't have enough smoke alarms, we're going to give them smoke alarms. Whatever it is, it's just part of this holistic approach to uh, management. So you can see we use a, uh, a assessment checklist that follows those keep it principles. We score and rate conditions and then that scoring is actually uh, color coded and they get a score for each of those principles. And their house is either good, fair, or they need to take action. And we, we have a systematic rating of each of those uh, components. So let's look at this as an example. Here's a bedroom. What do you guys observe in this bedroom? What are the concerns related to exposure? 
The vents are blocked. If they have vents. <laughs> if there are vents. Yeah. So, so what would be a hint they may or may not have vents and that they're blocked? Something in the photo. The fan. What? Fan. The fan. You got a fan right there in the uh, lower right blowing into the room from the doorway. Photos taken from the doorway. So exactly right. It's either they've corrupted the way the system is supposed to work because they want to have their furniture in the right place, so they've blocked the return of that through the air. So part of it is education. Hey, these actually need to be open so air can flow. Oh, okay. So what would be, if they didn't have any duct work, well, then you've got a much more significant problem. What are the other things? You said messy. What, what, is, what, what would be implied by messy? Yeah, so the, the clutter... Uh, does it make it easy to clean the room? Mm -hmm. So if it's not a cleanable, I mean, it's potentially cleanable if you could help them organize some stuff. So sometimes it's just helping them figure out how to organize stuff. Hey, how about a toy box? How about a shelf? How about we put, you know, have somebody put some shelves up in this room? Carpet, yeah. Yeah, they got it. Does the carpet look like it's in good shape? Does it look old? Now, we're just looking at photos here. So typically, there, there are two factors there. One, the age of the carpet. If generally carpet manufactured before about 2005, um, much of it had a woven back and not a solid back. A woven back, uh, any kind of settled dirt and dirt gets embedded in the carpet, and you can't effectively vacuum it out. It can't be removed. If you get any moisture to that, then you get microbial growth inside the carpet. Uh, and creates uh, real problems for trying to clean it or, or to remove the exposure. So that's why removal of carpet ends up being an effective strategy because these people have old, dank, nasty carpet. The other part is that is the maintenance of the carpet. If they're not routinely cleaning, vacuuming, or maintaining, uh, if they have carpet, then it becomes a significant problem. Most modern carpet, like the one we're all sitting on, has a solid back, low pile. It's designed to be vacuumed. Old carpet was designed, you know, like shag carpet. What the hell was that designed for? I don't know. <laughs> ugliness, I guess. It looks hairy, right? <laughs> but uh, weird colors and, and long, strange fibers, bad news. These kind of carpets are specifically designed to be maintained. So you can use a vacuum. Your vacuum has a beater bar on it, an agitator that vibrates the carpet that kicks the dust up in the air where it can be sucked into the vacuum. So it, there's a sort of a common sense approach to all of that. But it also eliminates the ability for dust to get embedded deep in the carpet. So we might want to, some families don't, they, they want to have carpet in the room. So if we can just modernize what kind of carpet they have or maybe even use some green carpet products that are low VOC, they don't generate off-gassing chemicals, uh, that might be a, a, a what about this room? Not cluttered. cluttered. Carpet looks clean. Windows aren't blocked. Curtains. <laughs> so uh, are there are there more or less allergen reservoirs in this room versus this room? Less. Are you sure? There's a lot less. Reservoirs. Is there any less? bedding or carpeting or there is a few stuffed animals. Mm -hmm. Is it towel? Is that a towel? Uh, to the immediate left? Yes. Yeah. Big beach towel. <laughs> Still don't see any vents. Still don't see any vents. Could walk around the room and we assume they're probably there. Here it's an older house. Upstairs, you can see the incline of the roof here by the bunk bed. Um, so we may be in a room that doesn't ha actually have uh, uh, a vent. Probably does, but it's possible in an older house. Newer houses, generally, they do. So clearly, this looks like it's a newer house. But the point is that just because it might be a newer house, you still have a similar amount of reservoirs, and much of the education still applies as far as reducing exposure. So here's an example of uh, our quantitative data sheet. So we color code those as well. We try to color code all of our stuff that, so they know when they see a, a number or they see a score. If it's green, it's good. If it's yellow, there's a concern. If it's red, kind of pink on here. But if it's red, oh, I need to take action. So it really helps them focus on what were these specific issues we found in their home. 
And then here's an example of our current reports where we give them an idea of what's good, we give them an idea of what we recommend to make changes, some key photos related to what we saw, and then what their scores were for each of the Keep It principles, and then uh, those scores on a chart. So we try to provide uh, something that's visually appealing and easy to understand, because uh, we find, as you know, uh, the average reading level nationwide is right around third to fourth grade. And uh, actually here in Children's Mercy, they recommend we write our reports at the third grade level. So third grade level literacy is pretty simple, straightforward language. So we have to be very straightforward in our reports and what they say. So it's this combination of the home assessment. We provide all families with some kind of a evidence-based cleaning kit and safety kit. Uh, so they, might, they get a vacuum, they get uh, cleaning supplies, we teach them about a proper way to sweep. We don't recommend dry sweeping. We recommend a damp sweep or a swipe with a, a Swiffer-like thing. Uh, we're trying to reduce the amount of dust that becomes uh, uh, resuspended. So we try to teach them it's not the dust you see, it's the dust you breathe. So we really want to reduce the amount of dust that gets kicked into the air. And there's lots of studies to show resuspension of particulate, and that's one of the primary causes of exposure. And we've done some particle analysis to show. Just a kid bouncing around in his room is enough to kick up all sorts of particles in the air that then they are now breathing versus if they never went in their room, uh, all the particles would be settled and wouldn't be getting out. So the more they can clean those spaces, the better. So this just shows you a quick survey of the different kinds of interventions that we've paid for. A lot of people's uh, furnaces either need to be repaired or cleaned or service people don't, aren't servicing them on a, uh, often enough. So there's lots of problems associated with that, but we've, we've paid for a whole host of different kinds of home repairs. Our average cost per home, I don't know if it's in there, I think it's in there. Um, our average cost right now for interventions from us is right around $2,000, and that's actually fairly common around uh, the country for asthma uh, healthy home programs. That specifically for asthma, there uh, we also do lead and other things. But for for asthma, the interventions are pretty straightforward. It's right around an average of two thousand. But like I said, we have had some homes we spent a significant amount trying to just make the home safer and healthier. Um, uh, right now, uh, the grant pays for the healthy home kits. So for your patients, we we have a free healthy home kit. We have a basic one for those. Uh, slightly lower risk, they still get a vacuum and they get some furnace filters and some other things. And then we, for the higher risk, we have a more intensive kit. So everybody gets some kind of a healthy home kit. We're talking with philanthropy to try to get some corporate support for that and, and uh, people to pay for some of the resources. Right now it's paid by Children's Mercy, so well, the grant pays for it. But historically, if we didn't have a grant, uh, Community Benefit went ahead and paid to provide a kit to all families. So if, if we they go through our process, and we feel it would be of value to them to have a home assessment. And we go to the home. They are going to get uh, some healthy home resources to try to help them mitigate and eliminate some of those exposures, because that's what it's all about. Uh, this is just an example of those findings that go back into the uh, EMR. So this is what you might find, summary information about the client, what their top five issues were. I wanted to point out this is an article we published uh, a couple of years ago looking at some of the papers that showed when you meet with a family and you make recommendations that they do certain things, they are going to promise to do those things. But if you check with them in six months, did they do those things? Uh, quite a few did not do what you recommended they do. <laughs> they promised to do it, but they didn't actually do it. So this is a couple of different studies that looked at when people were asked, what would you be willing to do to reduce uh, your exposure to, to allergens, and then they asked them six months later, what did, what did you do? This is what you said you would do, what did you do? And they found with many of these things, uh, people just didn't do what they said they would. So you see this all the time, it's a matter of compliance and adherence. Are they, are they going to comply with what you're asking them to do? And the challenge with asthma, and no doubt you see this, is that people don't make the same connection that they do with other chronic diseases, like with diabetes. You know, they don't insulin, they're in serious trouble. Whereas with asthma, they may let it go, right? They won't, they won't take the controllers because they think, oh, I don't need these things. And after a while, it gets bad enough, oh, boom, they're back in urgent care or they're in the ED because they aren't doing what you asked them to in the, because they haven't made that connection yet. So that's a big challenge with just case management, disease management for these kids and uh, the caregivers 
haven't bought in completely to the, the importance of the controller medicine for the things you're recommending. So if we can help reinforce that out in the home uh, that, or at the school, that's not that much better. I wanted to point out that we do have some training classes that you might find of value, and uh, Dr. Dowling has supported having with some advance notice, having uh, any of you participate in the Healthy Home Classes. We've been a training center for the National Center for Healthy Housing since 2007. Actually, I would even say we're probably one of the leading training centers in the nation. And we actually got an award from HUD in 2014, I think it was, uh, on training. So some of the courses that were actually developed here by us are the ones that are related specifically to assessment and characterization of risks. So we teach three basic courses here locally. One is a just Healthy Home Principles, a one-day course. Then we teach a course for community health workers that is an asthma educator course followed by assessment or Healthy Home Essentials and assessment practice. And then we have an advanced course for public health, environmental health, uh, professional health, whoever, advanced course that is Healthy Home Essentials followed by Healthy Home Assessment Principles and Practice, where we really dive deep into the, all of these different keep it principles, the science, the evidence behind them, what you need to know about PASS, for example, and then we actually take the class, teach them about doing home assessments, uh, taking an environmental history, we take that class to a home, everybody practices doing a home assessment in, in teams, and we walk through the whole, how do I prioritize the, the issues I saw in this home? If I went to a home and saw 100 different concerns, and that's pretty common, how do I, what do I do with that information? And what are the top five? How do I figure out what are my, the ones I'm most concerned about? And what, what is the process of communicating about that risk? So we get into that kind of detail. Uh, this just shows you some of the things that are taught in those classes. These are some of the students, actually. We, go, we actually do field work, like I said, out of house. We teach them how to use some diagnostic tools. Um, there's a, a very hot discussion on Medicaid reimbursement for healthy home services. Missouri is the only state in the nation that actually has a system, but the problem, Missouri did it sort of backwards. They created the ability right away to reimburse, but there's no capacity for people to do the work. So they're slowly building up the number of registered uh, asthma educators, the number of registered environmental assessors. There are specific criteria to be approved to be either one. Once you're listed in their system, and there's a lot of bureaucracy to go through to become listed, but once you are listed in the system, then a provider looking at one of your patients uh, that might meet the criteria, which are the same criteria for our high-risk asthma protocol. Uh, they have to have had two ED visits, one hospitalization, or some other criteria in the past in order to be uh, referred for a home visit, and then any patient can have up to two home visits in a year, and actually more if, if you advocate for that patient needing a follow-up home visit or whatever. Uh, but many states are working on setting that process up. There's about seven right now that the legislatures are actively working to create that reimbursement mechanism. All of them are focusing on using community health workers to um, provide this primary service. We are advocating for this stratification where community health workers may do the majority of the work, but there needs to be a connection to housing or environmental people because we're talking about home environments, buildings, and community health workers are health educators. They are not experts on buildings. They don't know how a building is constructed. They don't know how it's designed. Um, I wanted to point out these, if you haven't heard of these, that's what I've given you, this second handout I gave you from these clinical practice guidelines, these environmental assessment um, and uh, intervention guidance, uh, I gave you a summary document of the summary statements. So that takes all the parameters, the furry animals, rodents, roaches, dust mites, and gives you all the summary documents. And then there are a, a series of papers, I can't quite tell here, but there was a series of six guidance papers that we published in 2016 as a themed article on mold, a themed journal on mold issues. So just very quickly, here is uh, a little bit from the, those guidance documents. So in there, there are questions for you, a clinician, that you can use. As, so you were talking about dust mites earlier. There's a set of questions in the dust mite parameter you can use to understand um, potential exposure risk for dust mite. And then based on how they answer these questions, uh, there are additional uh, questions you can ask to further guide what interventions you would recommend specifically to them. And that's just based on 
you asking certain questions in the clinic, that's not necessarily a going, someone, sending someone to the home environment. So there are important evidence-based questions that you can ask that tell you, oh, you should go, you should be doing this to reduce dust mite exposure. The same is true for the cockroach and other parameters. So there's a whole algorithm in there for your decision making, both on wh what you might ask in the clinic and then what might occur in the home and what kind of decision making process there is for uh, eliminating uh, cockroaches or rodents or whatever. Each parameter has a decision-making algorithm. Then from the mold papers uh, series, there's one that's specifically what questions a clinician could ask related to mold. Again, it's two stages. The first is this series of five basic questions about what they've observed in their home and then based on how they answer those, there are follow-up questions that they can ask and if they answer with a certain response, you know that there, like, that kind of exposure isn't occurring. If they answer in the positive or with a different response, it indicates there is exposure, and therefore you would recommend a home assessment. So it helps to guide uh, what kind of recommendations you might make to a particular patient. The nice thing about those parameters, too, is that it's pretty comprehensive. It goes over um, what are the health effects you might see, what are the, the testing, clinical testing you might do, what, what is the home assessment process, what are the home interventions that are known to work. So it goes through all the components and how they relate. So what I've handed you there is a list of the summary statements uh, specifically from that, and then there's an evidence ranking for each of those summary statements, A, B, C, I think it goes A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, something like that. I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but it tells you the, well, it just tells you the quality of the evidence to support that summary statement. If you see clinical practice parameters, they, they all have a series of summary statements. So I just want to end by saying that what we find, it isn't about uh, specifically just the environmental assessment. It isn't about the return on investment. It isn't just about um, that patient or the healthcare system. It's, it's you guys are dealing with patients with lots of complex comorbidities. There are tremendous issues in this community as far as disparities, health disparities that are uh, leading to uh, a lot of uh, asthma incidents in uh, the urban core. And uh, there are a lot of those kind of things you can't control for. But all we can do is try to help families to improve the, the conditions they live in, try to improve the community. So clearly our hospital, we're fortunate, has lots of uh, community missions, different kinds of initiatives and programs that are going on in the community to try to improve community health that ultimately ends up improving kids, and it's all about the kids, right? Call me at any time about any kind of technical question. I'm happy to answer questions now, but um, we are also, I uh, didn't have time to really put it in here, but we are also the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit for this region. It's an EPA, Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry, funded a, a technical support for any provider. So any provider can call this 800 number, really anybody can, but it's really targeted towards providers to be technical support for you. So it is a physician here, you're worried about an environmental exposure in a given community, but really about any issue, if you want to call us about mold, we, we, we can help you uh, in dealing with the environmental factors associated with mold, or if you want to, you guys would be the experts on the clinical uh, evidence of exposure to something. But if you need help with dealing with environmental concerns and uh, concerns out in a home or community or building, uh, you can absolutely contact us about helping you or just have your, client, your patient or client or families contact us. We're happy to help them. I talked fast and clear. <laughs> Any questions? Or I covered it all. <laughs> so do these families have to have certain like financial needs? Their home or anyone could follow well, I would hope that a, a family living in the suburbs where both uh, parents work and make, I don't know, 300000 a year uh -huh. don't need our help in repairing their house, right? You hope. Um, so <laughs> first, um, right now there is no charge for our assessment service. You make a referral for a family to us and we deem that a, a home assessment would be appropriate, there's no cost to them for doing that, whether we have a grant or not. And then if, uh, if uh, there are home issues, that generally, if they qualify for Medicaid, they qualify for the home interventions, 
general rule of thumb. In the past, some of our grants did have income guidelines. The foundation grants, like the one we have right now, don't really have an income guideline, but the grant assumes that you're trying to focus on uh, low-income families and give them resources to try to improve uh, the environment that they're dealing with. Thank you.